So, uh, good morning. While he's, uh, setting up... Muy buenos días. Mientras él organiza so, uh, las diapositivas. Uh, I wanted to start by thanking the conference uh, organizers and course directors, and in particular, Dr. Louis Sainz and the team here at FCI for really putting together a fantastic uh, program. I think that uh, yesterday was really high yield in terms of uh, educational value, and I, I'm sure today will, will be just the same. So I just uh, wanted to, to make sure that I, I mentioned that. And uh, my talk actually will, yeah. My talk will actually also uh, reference uh, the, the conversation that you were just having just now uh, about uh, what to do in terms of uh, CRT patients that are uh, non-responders or patients that have, uh, you know, scar uh, at where you want to place the lead. I'll be talking about uh, novel approaches to pacing, uh, particularly uh, his bundle pacing. And uh, I have novel here in quotation marks because his bundle pacing is not new. It's actually been around for a long time but it's uh, facing a, a resurgence now. Our area of interest actually with regards to uh, his bundle pacing is actually for resynchronization and that's what most of my uh, talk will be on today. So I think it's really uh, uh, a nice segue to a, another approach for patients that you have difficulty placing LV leads. So I have no uh, disclosures and these are my acknowledgements. So I think the, the David trial, uh, many of you might be familiar with that trial, I think was the first study to really help clue us in that RV apical pacing uh, can have uh, detrimental effects. Uh, what they did in the study, let me make sure this works here, okay, good. What they did in the study was they randomized about uh, 500 patients to, who were getting ICDs to receive a uh, backup uh, a pacemaker set at VVI-40 versus DDDR-70. And the you know, uh, understanding is that uh, this group here will have a higher pacing burden. And very nicely, what they demonstrated is that those in the DDDR group where the pacing burden will be higher do have a greater risk of uh, their uh, MACE here, which was death or first hospitalization for new or worsened CHF compared to those who were set at uh, VVI-40. And in a subgroup analysis, when they looked at, you know, was it just a pacing mode or, uh, you know, what, what is, as essentially uh, was accounting for this uh, difference in outcomes, it was really that those with the higher pacing burden in that DDDR mode did much worse than those with the lower pacing burden. So RV apical pacing can certainly have uh, detrimental uh, effects. And that, you know, likely comes from adverse myocardial activation, poor energetic use, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So this is where his, bun his bundle pacing really has uh, been, been used the most. And no talk on his bundle pacing can really uh, occur without acknowledging the work of uh, Dr. Benjamin uh, Sherlag, uh, shown here, who in 1967 uh, published the first, uh, essentially, demonstration of uh, his bundle pacing. And what you can see nicely here is that uh, this uh, sinus rhythm here, you see this QRS morphology, and he paces the his bundle with no P wave before uh, this QRS that's identical to, to sinus rhythm. He then paces the atrium to show you that this is what atrial activation looks like, and again with the identical QRS, showing that you can actually capture and paste the his bundle. So, but the area that's really captured our interest at UCLA is the fact that you can use his bundle pacing to actually normalize bundle branch block patterns, and you can do this in uh, heart failure patients, certainly. And what's shown here is a, a left bundle branch block uh, uh, tracing with uh, HV recorded from the proximal His bundle, you see that HV times 65 milliseconds, and from the distal His bundle, that's 45 milliseconds, suggesting some intrahisian block. And what they do is they pace from the proximal His bundle and show that you don't change the QRS morphology, but when you pace from the distal, you can actually narrow the QRS. And the idea there is that within the His bundle, the fibers that might be going to the left or right bundle might be predestined, uh, and this theory is being challenged and has been challenged, but might be predestined such that if you pace in the distal his bundle, you might be able to narrow the QRS. And so what we're doing with his bundle pacing is that we're putting an LV lead, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what we're, what we're doing, but we're uh, putting a pacemaker lead, it's the Medtronic 3830 lead, uh, into the uh, you know, proximal uh, AV septal uh, area. We'll talk a little bit more about the anatomy shortly. And if you get right into the His bundle and you pace there, 
you get a HV interval and what looks like an intrinsic QRS. Uh, you know, if conduction is intact in the, in, the, uh, in the ventricle otherwise. And if you get somewhere near the His bundle and you paste that, then usually what happens is you get uh, a pseudo delta wave from local myocardial capture. And this is called non-selective His capture. This is called selective His capture. Uh, some other names for both of these conditions, but we'll just stick with selective His capture and non-selective His capture. So just taking a step back before we get into the nitty gritty of things here, uh, most people credit William Hiss Jr. for uh, describing the Hiss bundle, but it actually wouldn't have happened without his father, uh, Hiss uh, Sr., who was a well-known uh, anatomist uh, in Europe. Uh, he was very interested in embryology and had worked very hard on dissecting many different species uh, uh, developing hearts. And he came across a structure called the spina vestibuli that for whatever reason, he maybe didn't have time to, to look into that. But he encouraged uh, his son, so Willem Hiss Jr., uh, third son, who he sent to all the best institutions in Europe at the time to train. He encouraged him to look into the spina vestibuli. And it was in the course of that work that he essentially identified and, and described the, the his bundle. And these are some of his uh, initial tracings. Now, even with that description, he faced uh, a certain amount of uh, resistance uh, from you know, a number of people, including one named uh, Arthur, Arthur Keith. But the value of the his bundle actually really didn't come into play until the work of Sinal Tawara, who in 1906 uh, described essentially the, the, the his Purkinje uh, system or the, the Purkinje system. And what that did is I, that gave a relevance or gave an understanding of what the His bundle was actually doing was that it was conveying electrical activity from the atria, you know, through this, uh, uh, this AV canal to uh, this system here that's in the right and left ventricle. So that's really how the, the you know, really uh, His bundle was discovered. And this is a original tracing here from uh, Sinal Tawara. Uh, with his uh, description of uh, essentially where the his bundle uh, was going uh, in the in the ventricles. So the his bundle has two components. So it's just talking about some anatomy here of the his bundle. There's the penetrating his bundle, which is the part that actually crosses the central fibrous body, and I'll show you an image of that. And the branching his bundle, which is the part that actually gives off the left and right bundles. And most people think that the his bundle goes and splits into two. But what it really is is that the his bundle continues and then goes to become the right bundle while the left bundle actually branches off. And the point where the left posterior uh, fibers start to come off, that's what defines the, the, uh, the, the branching uh, his bundle. And both are about, uh, each of these are about uh, five to 10 millimeters uh, in length. Again, the penetrating portion is what pierces the central fibrous body. It's a right-sided structure. So most times when we're trying to get our catheter in, we're trying to get into uh, a point that's, that's distal uh, to this. Um, and the branching portion, again, sort of runs along the interventricular uh, septal crest on the left side and essentially starts right when the left pos uh, posterior fascicle starts, so uh, right about here. So that's the his bundle. And then, you know, this image, again, from the McAlpine really helps us understand this area a little bit better. Uh, if you look at this animation here, let me go back here, uh, that really, uh, you know, really highlights this uh, membranous septal area. Again, the, the muscular septum will be down here uh, and the membranous septum here. This is uh, where the Gerbodi defect, which is the LV to uh, uh, RA uh, 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 defect can occur where you'll get sort of a left to right uh, shunt. And if you look at the magnified image here uh, uh, of that, this is the, the region that, uh, that that this uh, his bundle is actually uh, crossing through. So when it comes to his bundle pacing for CRT, uh, a number of case reports have been uh, described in the literature uh, about using his bundle for, for CRT, but the work of Dan Lustgarden at uh, Vermont was really one of the first that uh, kind of helped bring it uh, more to the, the forefront. And essentially what he did was a sort of a complicated uh, procedure where he uh, actually put in both a CS lead and a his bundle lead uh, and used a white connector to uh, essentially be able to switch between uh, LV pacing and his bundle pacing. And essentially what he showed uh, is that the improvements that you get in terms of EF, NYHA class, quality of life in six minute walk test were equal with uh, a CS lead versus uh, a his bundle lead. 
So talking about doing uh, uh, his bundle implantation, the things that allow us to do that, uh, I mentioned the Medtronic 3830 lead, which is this, it's not an active fix fixation lead, the, the screw's actually out, and you actually turn the entire lead to screw it into place. But the catheters that really allow us to make the right turns to get into the his bundle area to place uh, the lead. So one of the favorite, my favorite catheters to use is this uh, C315, the H version of this, uh, or the uh, deflectable uh, uh, sheath to, to get into the region. And this is the lead here. This is that uh, Medtronic 3830 Select Secure lead. So this is essentially the component that's uh, really allowed us to uh, move uh, his bundle pacing uh, uh, forward. Now, I had some videos, but in the interest of time, I was told I'll only have about 15 minutes, so uh, I'm not going to show the videos. But just to really walk you through uh, sort of uh, my approach to uh, his bundle pacing uh, is, uh, you know, we obviously make sure that uh, the veins uh, open uh, with the venogram. Then uh, this was one of my earlier cases. I would put up a, uh, a CRD2 catheter from the groin to the his bundle region. And I would actually pace at high output to see if I can narrow the QRS. Uh, that told, suggested that his bundle pacing uh, may work. Um, and in that case, I proceed with uh, a, a his bundle uh, a pacing case. Uh, put the wires down, and then, you know, uh, for a CRTD case, put the RV lead in, uh, drop the right atrial lead, uh, and put that in the IVC. And then we put in uh, either that C315H uh, catheter uh, that we're going to deploy the lead through or the deflectable sheath. And then we start mapping in this area and uh, using the uh, CRD2 catheter uh, as a guide, as you can imagine. And this is what we're looking for here. Uh, this is a, a tracing at uh, one of those sites before we deploy the lead. And you can ni nicely see an atrial uh, deflection here, a his deflection, and the ventricular def uh, deflection as well. And one key point here is that the ventricular deflection, as you can see, is much bigger than the uh, atrial deflection, telling us that we're distal. And that's where we want to put the lead. We don't want to put the his bundle lead too proximal, uh, where uh, you know, additional block may develop or, uh, or block may progress. Uh, that's sort of where we want to place the lead. So, and then after screwing it in, uh, this is uh, sort of what we see here again, AHV. Uh, and then uh, once the, the sheath has been split, this is uh, what it, what it uh, looks like. So uh, once we map, we find the position we want to be in. We actually turn the entire lead to screw it into place. And then we start walking back uh, the sheath gradually under fluoroscopy. And then same thing on the fluoroscopy. We pull back the uh, CRD2 catheter and then place the uh, atrial lead and finish the case. And this takes me a little bit less time probably that, than it would take me to do a, a, a coronary sinus lead. So now that we've talked about doing that, what are sort of the types of results that we get? And, you know, this is sort of one of the things that, uh, that you can see. This is an actual case that we did at uh, UCLA. This was an uh, older gentleman in his uh, 70s with uh, ischemic cardiomyopathy, EF of 25%, who had this uh, left bundle with a pretty wide QRS. And with his bundle pacing, we're actually able to narrow that QRS down to 99 milliseconds. And in fact, you could see an interval here that would be the equivalent of an HV interval telling us that we were directly in the his bundle and capturing the, the, the his bundle itself. So uh, I'll just show a case of uh, what potentially his bundle pacing for CRT can uh, achieve. Uh, this was actually the very first case of his bundle that uh, I did uh, with my colleagues at uh, UCLA. Uh, this was a 74-year-old woman with uh, uh, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes. She had uh, asymmetric septal hypertrophy, and she had severe aortic stenosis and was uh, undergoing uh, surgery. She had an AVR and a septal myomectomy to alleviate the uh, alveolar tract obstruction. Uh, during the case, she actually developed complete heart block, but that got better by the fifth post-hospital day with the residual left bundle branch block. So, and she did find they got her up, walked her around. She didn't show any evidence of block, so she was discharged home. But over the next six months, her ejection fraction gradually declined from 60 to 20 to 15 percent. Her NYHA class went up uh, commensurately. And she started to have exertional dyspnea that then progressed to dyspnea at rest. So, uh, and she was optimized on medications over that time. She didn't have any coronary artery disease, and all her other workup was negative. So she had class one indication for CRTD. But one of the things that we thought was that this was likely a very structural thing. This is something that happened at the time of surgery. Uh, and the surgery that was happening was a myomectomy. So a surgeon was incising in that area. And we thought, well, potentially, 
could this be a case of very proximal block to where if we place the lead distally, we might be able to recruit both bundles and narrow her QRS. So we actually, because uh, his bundle facing is uh, currently not a guideline recommendation, we actually explained to her what uh, you know, we were planning to do, and she was in full agreement, so we uh, proceeded with the case. And again, just showing you, this is her valve that she got replaced. We put the CRD2 catheter up, and this was her HV interval was uh, 64 milliseconds. And so, you know, the case went fine. This is what we recorded. Again, V signal bigger than A signal, and we're recording a hiss right here. Um, and once the lead is deployed, uh, you know, this is sort of what it looks like. There's a uh, ICD lead here, the HIS bundle lead, and the uh, RA lead, and again, that bioprosthetic uh, aortic valve. And, you know, we had uh, capture thresholds of about 2 volts at 0.6 milliseconds. This is one of the issues with HIS bundle pacing is that you tend to need uh, slightly higher uh, capture thresholds and uh, impedance of about 513 ohms. And as far as her QRS goes, this is what we were able to achieve. We narrowed her from about 198 milliseconds to 123 milliseconds. And lo and behold, over the next six months, her ejection fraction went from 15% to 55%, and is still at that. In fact, she's in the 60 to 65% range now, and this was done about uh, almost three years ago now, and she's still doing great. And one thing, we, we ended up publishing this as a case report. One thing that was very unique about this case is that what people have reported in the past is to get a response like this, you actually had to get into the HIS bundle itself. But what we actually achieved for her was parahistian pacing. As you see, there's not a sort of a nice long isoelectric interval. So the fact that you don't even have to get into the HIS bundle, even just being near it and having parahistian pacing uh, enough is good enough to have this uh, sort of a, a response. So we went on, uh, you know, this was now uh, a couple of years ago, we went on to, uh, you know, uh, recruit a number of patients. Uh, and these were, because again, his bundle pacing is not a class one indication. Uh, these were patients with either failed CS lead uh, placement, CS dissection, uh, the lead uh, fell out, or, you know, in one, one or two patients, they were uh, de novo uh, his bundle lead cases. But we're usually reserving this for uh, the failures and it would be appropriate to the conversation we were uh, having earlier. So we obviously have now done more patients than this, but this was our initial experience presented at the American Heart Association in 2015. And those 17 patients, we were able to narrow the QRS from about 175 milliseconds to 122 milliseconds um, in, uh, in the cohort. And you know, uh, we, in most of the patients, we actually had non-selective HIS capture. Only in five did we feel like we actually got into the HIS bundle and captured the HIS bundle itself. And when you look at the capture threshold with the pulse width, again, with HIS bundle pacing, you tend to require slightly higher uh, capture thresholds. But again, we're of the, the mindset that, you know, if we can offer more physiologic pacing, um, even though the capture threshold is a little bit higher, that's probably better for the, the, the patient in the long run. Uh, we were able to improve uh, ejection fraction in the uh, patients uh, significantly. The LV dimension shrunk. And, the, uh, you know, and we just looked briefly at whether there was a relationship between the uh, QRS width and the degree of narrowing. And it looks like the longer the QRS width, the more narrowing you can get with uh, his bundle pacing. I'm not sure exactly why that seems to be the case, but in another study uh, with a larger data set, this actually still held uh, true. And, uh, you know, and the percent narrowing that you get, so your ability to narrow the QRS doesn't change really uh, based on the HV interval. So this uh, really, the HV interval is not a good predictor uh, of who would benefit from uh, uh, his bundle pacing. So, you know, we reported this again, this was a while ago, 13 implanted patients, uh, you know, one person died from a pneumonia and one person had to have their device uh, explanted for uh, an infection, but all patients doing well without arrhythmias or ICD shots, at least at the time this was presented. And you were mentioning earlier that we're about to uh, publish the paper. It's actually uh, already uh, in press as of uh, February, so uh, in, in heart rhythm. Uh, this is uh, our experience on 21 patients that were offered uh, his bundle pacing for CRT uh, and our uh, outcomes in, in, in that group. And the patients did well. We were, able, we were successful in 16 out of the 21 patients. And that was, the, at least to, to date, the, the largest uh, cohort that's been looked at for his bundle pacing for CRT. So uh, this is the reference uh, for anyone who's interested. So just uh, as I wrap up here in the last uh, minute or two that I have, 
is how does his bundle pacing narrow the QRS interval in bundle branch block? And I'm going to show you some ideas, but we don't really understand what's happening here by, by any means. The concept is something called longitudinal dissociation. And uh, it, it, it suggests that the fibers that are going to go, say, to the left bundle, uh, I'm sorry, to the left bundle or to the right bundle are predestined within the his bundle. So that if you have a block here, okay, these fibers are affected and you will have a left bundle branch block. But, and, and therefore, if you pace here, you will not be able to narrow the QRS. But if you pace here beyond that block, you would be able to narrow the QRS. Now, this would suggest that all the fibers in the His bundle are just going straight. And that's been shown in histology to not be the case. So even though this is sort of our best way of explaining what's happening, it, it probably isn't actually uh, uh, completely uh, correct. And uh, for those that might be uh, interested, uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to uh, co-edit the His bundle pacing uh, sim uh, symposium in the Journal of Electrocardiography with uh, Ken Ellenbogen and Ralph Lazar and Ben Sherlag, who actually developed the procedure. And we tried to put together uh, a, a very wide range of uh, topics and, and sort of educational material uh, to really help clue people into the value of his bundle pacing, not only just for pacing, but also for CRT. So uh, if for those who are interested in learning more, I definitely would, would recommend that you, uh, uh, re you know, look at this uh, compendium. So to wrap up, uh, I know that was a very quick whirlwind tour, but uh, many patients need devices. Uh, however, RV pacing can be detrimental, and his bundle pacing offers certainly an, uh, an uh, opportunity uh, to uh, achieve more physiologic pacing. Uh, but more importantly, at least from our standpoint, uh, for you know, the discussion, again, you were having earlier about needing to do so many different approaches with LV leads that you couldn't place, I think uh, it'd be important to consider his bundle pacing in some of those uh, patients uh, where you might actually be able to narrow their QRS to a significant degree. And the procedure, although I've made it seem very simple, there certainly is a learning curve and uh, you know, there are uh, uh, issues with acute thresholds rising. Those are pretty rare, thankfully, uh, but we could definitely use uh, better tools uh, to, to achieve this. So with that, I'll stop. I'll acknowledge my colleagues at UCLA and Dr. Shiv Kumar, who uh, you know, told me about this meeting. Again, it's been really a delightful experience to be here, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Ajijola, for your comprehensive uh, talk on beautiful anatomical images. Um, bueno, muchas gracias, uh, Dr. Ajijola. Thank you very much, Dr. Ajijolo. We have time for one question, if there are any questions, so that we can connect to the labs. We need a microphone over here. Excelente conferencia. Dos preguntas rápidas sobre el caso. Al final, usted termina. Connecting that to a live device with the his lead in the LV port. Yes. Are you programming pacing LV only? Yeah, so uh, I actually had a slide on, on how we, we do the, the programming, but I, I took that out in the interest of time. So uh, there are a couple of things that we do. Again, I, the data I showed you is for uh, CRTD, so that is what we do. A lot of those patients need a defibrillator, uh, defibrillator lead, and that's what uh, goes into the RV apex. So you need a device that can be programmed to an LV only? Exactly, and, and so what we do actually is we, uh, you know, if, if uh, the, the patient doesn't have heart block, then what we do is we program uh, LV only. If they, if they have some degree of block or we're worried about block, then what we'll do is we'll pre-excite the LV lead, which is the HIS lead, mm -hmm. by 80 milliseconds, which is, you know, or as long as you can program it out. Um, and then we, uh, uh, you know, by the time the ventricular uh, pacing kicks in already, mm -hmm. most of the QRS is, is, is kind of through. And, you know, that's actually, we've done that for a lot of those patients in that study, and they've done really quite well with that, with that uh, programming parameter. And the other part of that case was that with someone with a normal EF and a non-ischemic myopathy who dropped their EF because you cut the, uh, the left bundle with the procedure. Right. Um, CRTP or just a dual chamber pace with... Yeah, good good with question. The you know, the, lead? yeah, no, very good question. The the issue with her is that you know she'd been optimized for six months. Uh, well, as soon as really the, the EF drop was noticed, uh, she'd been optimized, and she obviously met criteria for CRT. And 
we weren't sure whether this would complete, you know, we weren't quite expecting the, you know, the reversal that, uh, that we saw, and so that's why she got the ICD. Um, I'm not sure whether uh, I would be bold enough to, you know, expect this in a patient and not put an ICD in if they, you know, uh, seem to meet I've that criteria. I've started doing that. If, if it's clearly a non-ischemic, no yeah. scar. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I should. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, that, that's an uh, interesting and provocative question. Bueno, muy bien.